Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming back to the podcast. My special guest today is Justine ward Mallinson, who is a judge out of uh, England. Justine, good to have you on the podcast. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Good, good. So I want to give credit where credit is due, and, and Michael Dillon helped set this up, so I appreciate him making that connection. I have uh, long seen your name on syllabuses around the world judging, and I thought, you know, that'd be a, you'd be a really good interview. Uh, someone to come on and tell us about those experiences. So let's start from the beginning. Um, my grandmother came from Ireland, and I was the second daughter. Um, big age gap between two sisters, 15 years. I was the sporty one. I was the one that was climbing trees, riding bikes, playing football. And I think my mum thought, oh, she needs something to burn this energy. And there was a dance school around the corner and Irish dancing just seemed to fit. So there I started and there I stayed with the hmm. same teacher for 18 years. Okay. Who was your teacher? My teacher was uh, Betty Kelly. She was a fiddle player as well. So she not only taught Irish dance and judged, she was a fashion musician as well. Okay. Now, do you by chance know who, what her origins were? Like who, who were her teachers? Um, <laughs> she was in her sixties when I started oh, dancing. Okay. So she, she's long, long gone, sadly. Um, but she came from Cavan. I know that. Okay. Very good. So, was Irish dancing popular in the part of England that, that you come from? Or was it was just maybe one school here and there? No, there were, there were quite a lot of schools in Manchester. I would say my teacher and another lady called Margaret O'Neill, <clears throat> they began teaching Irish dancing in Manchester. So the majority of the teachers that then were produced came from either of those two ladies. So you had uh, Lally School, you had Granger School, you had numerous schools that evolved and then their pupils obviously evolved into teaching as well. So Manchester, Manchester's always been quite thriving, really. Okay. Do you do you by chance know the origins of Irish dancing in that area? Do you know like the, maybe the first school or the first teacher that came in and started it? Um, I believe the Gaelic League were around, and my teacher, Miss Kelly, and this lady called Margaret O'Neill perhaps were part of the Gaelic League, and I'm pretty certain they would have been the instigators of, of setting up Irish dancing in, in Manchester. Okay. So what were some of your early memories of being a student in class? Do you, do you remember back to the easy rule and the light jig days? Um, I do. I do. Yeah. We, <laughs> she had a hierarchy. So when you were young, you had to take your place behind the bigger dancers. Oh. And she, she, it sounds ridiculous, but she never got off a chair. She used to sit with her legs crossed and she'd hold the violin and, um, there'd be a line of older dancers and then us younger people would be behind and it was survival of the fittest. If you learned it, you learned it. And if you didn't, then that was tough really. <laughs> okay. Uh, so progressing on, did, did you, did you find Irish dancing easy for you or was it a challenge? And, and how, how fast would you say you progressed on through sort of the grade levels? I think I moved relatively quickly. Um, I started age eight, which is quite old really in comparison to some children nowadays. Um, but I was winning championships within maybe 12 months. Um, so it, 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 I'm not saying I found it natural, but I think because of the enjoyment of doing it, I don't think something is a bit of a chore if you enjoy to do it. Practice isn't a chore. You know, my feet were always tapping. They put carpet under me at school because they said somebody was making a noise in the classroom. I said, it's not me. And then the carpet came and it was me, obviously. Um, <laughs> So my feet were never still. Was okay. like that. What was the emphasis of the school? Was it uh, more performance, community-based stuff? Obviously, obviously, there were competitions you were talking about, you moving up in those levels. Was there a specific focus of the school? We did a bit of everything, actually. Um, we did uh, a lot of displays. We, there was a, a big concert hall in Manchester called a Free Trade Hall. And we did quite a few performances there. She would have been known very well within the Irish community. So St. Patrick's Day, we would have gone out performing considerably. Um, but competition, because she was a fesh musician, wherever she was playing, we would be going to the fesh. Okay. Um, so if there was a fesh on every weekend, we, we would be at the fesh every weekend. Hmm. It was what as is, simple as that. Okay. Do you, do you remember or calling back to maybe the first competition or a couple of competitions you participated in. If you remember that first one, where was it at? 
it was in a church hall called St. Malachy's. And I was actually discussing this a couple of days ago because the first fesh friend I ever made was a, a girl from Newcastle. And we shared a coloring book in between dancing. We shared a coloring book. So we both sat there having a good chat and we became firm friends throughout our dancing career. Um, and she was in touch with me a couple of days ago. We're still friends nearly 50 years later. Okay. Can you mention her name? Uh, Patsy Ann O'Donnell. She's not actually involved in dancing anymore, but she was a fabulous, fabulous dancer. Okay. That's very good. Those, those relationships that we develop in Irish dancing, yeah, they can last a lifetime for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. What did you like about competition? Clearly, you, as you say, you advanced up pretty quick, so you must have liked it. What, what was it about it that you liked? Um, I was very lucky that my parents kept me grounded. Um, there was no bravado if I won anything. You know, you were kept very level-headed. The first championship I won, I believe, um, my dad said he was going to go and put the cup in the car. My mum said, why, what are you doing? He said, there's children in here that's not even won a medal. He said, there's no way she's parading around with the cup. So for me, as soon as I finished dancing, it was let's go play. Let's go have a bit of crack, you know, run around, meet people, enjoy, enjoy the social side of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. And at what point in time did you know that it was time to, to hang up the competitive shoes and look to see whatever may come next for you? <laughs> that didn't really want to come at all. I never, you know, I just loved to dance. However, the last year of uh, competition, I was on the stage at the world. It was the 25th anniversary world and I broke my foot on the stage. So that was the finish in me at 26. <laughs> Wow. The ripe old age of 26. That's not very old. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Okay. Would, would that be the same year that Olive Hurley made that video? Possibly. I'm not. I oh, was... The, the, the was a, there was a 25th anniversary video of the event. Yeah. I think that was it. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'm on it for a split second. <laughs> okay. Do you yeah. remember what happened? Like, how did you break your foot? Was it coming out of a movement or a slippery spot? I, th I thought it was the floor that cracked. I was dancing oh. the light round and I heard a crack and initially I thought it was the floor and then I realized, oh, wait a minute, I, I, I can't. So I sort of hobbled off and remember holding onto the piano and then and then being carried off side stage. Oh my gosh. So what did yeah. that do to you psychologically? Obviously that's a devastating injury, but how did it affect you? Um, I, think, I, I think I'd probably in my mind, known that that was going to be the last world that I competed at. So I suppose there was a little bit of disappointment, um, but there was also the prospect that, okay, let's move on to the next venture, which would be teaching. So I think, I don't know whether I even had gone home before I put a letter into the commission to say, can I apply to be a teacher, please? Oh. <laughs> Okay. So, so you had the plans there. You already had the plans in place. Yeah. It was never, it was never something that was not going to be. Yeah. Okay. Speaking real quickly on world championships and majors, uh, sounds like you've done a number of them. What were, what were some of your favorite memories of the major competitions? Maybe where they were located, maybe an anecdotal story uh -huh. surrounding a particular event. Recall some of those for us. I used to like Galway. Okay. Um, Galway seemed to be quite good fun. I was I was quite sheltered in many ways. Um, although I had the social side when I was younger and I would go off playing, going out and doing the bar scene, that, that was not me. That was not my bag. And plus, like I say, my mum kept me on a short reign. <laughs> um, but Galway, I think, was the first time where I did experience more of that. I think it was probably about 18, 19 and we couldn't get in anywhere. Of course, Good Friday in Ireland, everywhere closes. So trying to find a bar or trying to find a pub that's open on Good Friday is not easy. And the only way we could do it, I was with a, a, a guy who used to dance for a, another school in Manchester. We had to pretend that we were his teachers to get into the hotel to try and find a drink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not. Go I'm not going to mention the name You're of the teacher. No, no, okay. no, no, no. <laughs> but that was the only way we could get into this pub that had a bar that was open. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, as you said, your last world championships, you knew you were going to go straight away to go and join the commission or 
I guess, pass your teacher's exam and then join the commission. But uh, yeah. what was that process like for you? You know, everyone's got a different story with taking that teacher's exam. It, and usually it's never an, a story about how easy it was. What was yours, your experience like? I loved school. I absolutely loved the whole school environment. But when it came to exams, I do as little as I needed to do to pass the exams. But with the teaching exam i have never ever ever in my life revised as hard for anything as i did for that hmm. it came everywhere the book came it was tattered it was torn but hopefully i knew it inside out because i did pass i passed both teachers and adjudicators first time well, that's good very good for you uh, do you remember when that was what year was that that you took your exam I think the teaching exam was 1994, so this would okay. be my 30th year of teaching. Okay. And the AD, I was 30, so possibly 1997. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you've, you've probably talked to a number of people who've taken their exam uh, since you've taken yours. Maybe you've trained some people. How has it changed? Because I know... Uh, my own experiences with that process, you know, I, and you talk to people after that, it's, it's, it's changed a little bit. Like maybe you don't do as much now or they did more back then. I think there, <clears throat> there seems to be, um, I don't have a massive knowledge of how it's changed, sure. but I think there are a lot more support groups mm -hmm. for people wanting to take the teachers or adjudicators. I think there are a lot more people willing to give their knowledge of the process um when i went to take mine I, I, i'm not saying that my teacher wasn't supportive at all i remember when i got home from the exam she was on the phone first of all asking me every question that I, I, i'd answered but i came from a very small school we'd never done kayleys oh. so 90 percent of my learning for that exam was literally from the book um, and I, th I think things are slightly different now. There are training videos, you know, there's this, a, a teacher's group set up or a TCRG um, group set up where everybody sort of like gives a little bit of advice. So I think in that respect, it's probably evolved and changed where I'm not saying it made it easier or it's making right. it easier, but, but there is a little bit more support. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, you talked about not necessarily having the support groups that you had that we have now, as you mentioned, but um, did you have maybe have like a study buddy or someone that you go practice with that you could kind of commiserate with and, and work together or, or did you do it no. pretty much on your own? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I met people at the exam that I became very good friends with. Mm -hmm. um, again, that was good. Um, my teacher, she, she did used to bring people into the class. So I suppose she did do that sort of support, but, I was still dancing when those people were coming in to do theirs. It wasn't when I was doing mine. Mm -hmm. So there were people within the region that were getting ready to take their exams. I taught quite a few of them, the traditional set dances. But it, it, when I was ready for teaching, my teacher was coming to the end of her teaching career. So we didn't, we didn't have that same network of people to work with. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once you got the, uh, I guess back then it would have been the letter in the mail, you know, nowadays it's everybody gets these emails, but uh, you get the, net, the letter in the mail and you find out you passed. Wh what were your first thoughts of what's next? Well, the funny thing was I hadn't gone to that world because obviously I didn't have pupils mm -hmm. at that point. And I actually got phone calls. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm digressing because I'm moving on to the AD actually. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I got phone calls from people asking me, would I judge feshes? And I didn't know that I'd passed the exam. <laughs> oh. um, so the teacher's one, I remember that coming through the door. I got that at Christmas. It came in a brown envelope. And everybody said, if you get a brown envelope, then it's not good news. Oh. Um, but I did get a brown envelope and it was good news. Hmm. But like I say, with the AD, I think they must have done the um, the awards you know they do the awards for the new tcs mm -hmm. and ad's mm -hmm. and obviously somebody had heard my name at the world and phoned me and said would you judge my fashion i said well i don't even know whether i've passed it or not <laughs> no. um but again fortunately i had so i accepted the fashion <laughs> okay well the story we used to get over here i i took my exam back in the um 
the late 2000s and was not successful with the Kaylee. So I relate to that. I didn't have to do the, I didn't have the Kaylee background like you, you said you didn't either. But uh, the story back then was if you got the small envelope, it was bad news. If you got the big one, it was good because the certificate would be in the big one. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's true or not, but that was the story that went around back then. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, um, well, that's good. Now, when you, when you started off teaching, did you immediately go out on your own? Was that the plan or did you start teaching for your teacher? No, um, like I say, my teacher probably right. when I first started teaching would be nearly in her 80s. Mm. Um, so she really had, she, I know that she did sit in on classes of another girl that had been a pupil within our class. She was a little bit older than me and she passed her exams before me. So she used to sit in on her classes. But when I started teaching, I, I taught completely on my own. I still do. I, I've never taught with anybody else. Okay. Okay. I was going to ask you that if, if you'd had that experience teaching with someone else, how did you make it work? But you, you didn't do that. So <laughs> I, don't, I, yeah. I don't think I could now purely because I'm so used to just being so independent. If, if I'm in class and I might be with this group, I can be seeing what's going on over there. And even if I was to ask one of the big girls, could you just look at those? I'm still looking over there to see what corrections they're giving to the group that I've just asked them to look at. So I just think I'm a, a little bit OCD. I do I do have a senior dancer who who I would say maybe in the next 12 months would potentially be looking to, to, to do a teacher's. And I would like to hope that she would come in to teach with me, whether okay. it be together or she has her own class as part of the class. Right. I would like to hope that's the case. Okay. And, and I guess that would make sense because this is someone that you've trained from not being a dancer to becoming a dancer. So, you, so you'd be very familiar with her as opposed to bringing maybe someone in who you've never really taught with before. You'd there be that familiarity. Well, she's danced for me for 22 years. So I'd like to hope that, you know, we've had a very good working relationship for all that time. Um, I just, I just, I think I would personally find it very difficult to trust because you see classes that work brilliantly with multiple teachers that may not be family, may not be relatives, they just make it work. But then you see other classes that have tried it and it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. So for me, I don't think I would be prepared to go down that road to give it the chance. I can understand that. I, I was fortunate enough to have have someone that I had trained and they started teaching with me and it was the best experience. We complimented each other very well, but uh, yeah. unfortunately they're not there. They went, went a different direction, but uh, yeah. But if you don't get the right fit in there, you, it's going to uh -huh. be a very strange dynamic in the class. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 Justine, when you started off, what did you call your school and where did you, you remember where you set up for the first time? Where did you start hosting classes? Uh, yep. Uh, the name of the school was Ward Mallinson. My husband's name is Mallinson. Um, and we weren't actually married at the time that I started the school. But another teacher who had had a class called Ward mm. said to me that I couldn't call mine Ward. So I had to tag his name on the end of it. Um, and then quite by accident, my teacher said to me, the priest at St. Mary's is looking for a dance teacher. So... This is St. Mary's close to where I live. Phoned the priest. He sounded very excited. Yes, we'd love to have a class here in Levenshoom. And I thought, I don't even know where Levenshoom is. Where's Levenshoom? Where is this St. Mary's? Because it's not the one I'm thinking of. So he sounded so disappointed when I said, oh, I'm not so sure I'd be able to get there. Um, I thought, oh, you know what? I better just give it a try. So unbeknownst to me, he denounced that the class was going to start at Mass. And a lady went to ask the priest who was going to be the teacher. And her daughter then was the first child that came through the door. And her mum had remembered me from being a dancer. Her sister was in my age group and her mum had remembered me. And she said, well, she said, as soon as I found out it was you, she said, I knew that's where I was going to take my daughter. <laughs> that's good. And it, it, it was a match made in heaven because she was one of the most successful kids that I ever taught. She was a dream, absolute dream. It was just meant to be. It was fortuitous. That's interesting. Now, how how yeah. far away was the church? Once you discovered where the church was at, was it just kind of a stone's throw, so to speak? No, it took me about an hour to get there. Oh. It would always it, it would only take about 20 minutes to get home. But in rush hour traffic, 
it would be an hour to get there. Yeah. Okay. Are so. you still teaching there to this day or did you, did you change locations over the years? No, I did change locations probably within the last maybe eight or nine years. Just, um, I think areas drop off. At one time, there were big pockets of Irish communities in the Manchester area. And then, you know, people move out, people change lifestyles and, and those areas are not as congested with Irish as they used to be. Mm -hmm. So maybe teaching in those areas, it's, it's time for changes. Sure. Did you find, Justine, that most of your... Uh your students came from sort of the Irish diaspora, the, the pockets that you're talking about, or did you get other people in the community who may not have had an Irish background or Irish connection? No. Um, I mean, I suppose some of them are immediate Irish descendants, mm -hmm. but then you might get second, third, fourth generation Irish that, that will come through the door. And then there are children that are completely English. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I used to teach in a school, um, just an after school class. It wasn't actually part of my dance school, but I taught many African children right. in that class and they, they were fantastic, mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, Irish dancing is for everybody. Sure, absolutely. What did you find maybe over the years and maybe you, that you still find that the students are really looking for when they come and join class. I know it, every, not everyone's looking for the same thing or the same connection, but have you found any sort of universal themes that you could apply across the board to why people are joining the classes? Um, my own personal take is that Irish dancing has always been popular. I remember going to that world in Cork in 84 and there were 300 girls in my age group. They had to split the competitions. So it's always been enormous, but I think with the evolution of river dance and Lord of the Dance, it's brought it to the masses that might necessarily not have known anything about Irish dancing. Mm -hmm. And whereas once upon a time it might have been for culture, I think now it's, oh, I could be in river dance, I could be in Lord of the Dance, I could, I could you know, I, I could do this. You've got kids spinning around in, in the houses watching those videos saying, I want to do Irish dancing. So I just think um, when I get a child through the door, you know, and the parent might say to me after a couple of weeks, do I need to get shoes? My answer would be no. Make sure your child really wants to do this before you start buying shoes. Right. You know, I, I wouldn't be wanting to push some, it's an expensive hobby at the end of the day nowadays. You know, you're not paying your 25p to go and dance in a church hall that you would have done when I was young. Right. Um, it, 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 it can be very, very costly at the top end of the game. So, you know, kids that come on a whim who might not want to stay, there's no point in trying to drag them into costumes, feshes, if, if that's what they want to then proceed to, then that's absolutely fine, mm -hmm. you know, but try and get the enjoyment from it first before you move into the competition side. Well, I'm not saying that the competition side isn't enjoyable, but I'm just saying, just try and take your time to get to that level. Sure. You spoke earlier in the interview, Justine, about your, uh, your dad grounding you and let's don't, you know, parade around the, the, the dance hall with the trophies and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, now you look at everything and I mean, it's so different than what it, it used to be, I would imagine, uh, going back. How do you, how, how were those lessons that, you, that your, your parents taught you and maybe your teacher taught you kind of helped you to remain grounded throughout the years and maybe not get so caught up in, I guess, the glitz and glamour and the kind of the, I don't know, uh, sometimes the over the top feeling that, that people outside of Irish dancing would look at and say, my gosh, this is like a beauty pageant. You know, they don't really yeah. understand it. How have you kind of navigated that? You have to go with a certain amount of it. Um, right. And I have kids that are at top level of dancing. They would go to Worlds and place well and all islands, etc. cetera, won major championships. And if, if that's the path that they want to take, then you can't actually discourage them. Personally, I'm not into the glitz and glamour. I would be more than happy if the dresses went back to a very basic level. Right. I would be more than happy if the wigs disappeared. 
Um, I know that's probably a very unpopular opinion. Not but, with me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I do, I do think, and I'm sure 99% of my pupils would tell you, I am a realist. I try to keep things as normal as possible. Yes, we 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 celebrate the success, but don't let it go to your head. You know, that's mm. that's yesterday's news. Let's move on to tomorrow. You know, so I, my kids wouldn't parade around with sashes or and that's not because I tell them not to. Mm. They just they just get that that you don't need to, you know. Right. Right. OK, so when you decided to take your uh, adjudicators exam, you, you said earlier that you passed it the first time. So, you know, I'm sure it was intimidating in its own way. But what did you find the most challenging aspect of that process? I'd probably say the interview. The interview. I've heard that many, many times. Okay. Yeah. Just because you don't know what's going to happen. It's, it's a new environment for you. You've not come across it before. The actual judging, I think if you've been teaching a while, I know when I actually said this in class the other night, as I said to the kids to try and get them to understand sometimes why I do critique them. I'm looking at you from an adjudicator's point of view. So if you were in front of me on a stage, this is what I would be thinking about your performance. And that would determine whether I would place you high or I would place you low or I would place you in the middle. So the judging side of things, I think I found slightly easier. I'm not saying easy, but slightly easier because I think if you've got that critical eye, then you can sort mm -hmm. the difference with it, between the dancers. Okay. So talking about that the eye of the adjudicator so someone comes in front of you right now whether it's a you know beginner or somewhere in the middle or a championship dancer what's the fastest way for them to lose points from justine timing timing okay yeah out of time <laughs> so no 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 and then when you proceed up to the advanced dancers i'm a sucker for rhythm mm -hmm. you know absolutely i like an energetic reel not slip jig i like a graceful slip jig Mm -hmm. But in the heavies, you have to be able to hit the floor. You have to be able to make some noise and you have to have a little bit of style. Right. You talked about rhythm and timing being important and choreography, as we know, has changed. It seems like it's constantly changing, but uh, there's, there's a lot more sounds to be made, and especially in a hard shoe these days. And there's different fusions of different styles in there. What do you think about that fusion and seeing more influence from other dance styles creep into Irish dancing? Some of it I like, some of it I think is just over the top. It wouldn't necessarily be my my thing. I can't say that I would penalise a dancer because of it. Again, it's down to the performance and it's not the child's fault. It's perhaps the choreography of the school or the choreo, you know, so um, it wouldn't be a deal breaker for a first place if the material wasn't to my taste, so long as it was in time, so long as it had rhythm, turnout, placement, carriage, if, it, if, if the majority of it was the whole thing, then, you know, then you've got to go with it. They're the best dancer on the day. Right. Going back to injuries, I'm, I'm sure you, you experienced a, a bad injury and I'm sure you've probably seen dancers tweak an ankle or something like that here and there. I watched the, the former assistant I mentioned break her leg in front of me at one night at class. And I just, I'd never experienced that before. So uh, how do you keep it on perspective? And when going back to your own, your own injury that you suffered there, which is right at the end of your competitive career, I'm sure that probably set you back some, but the, obviously you, you pushed your way through it or you wouldn't be doing what you do today. How do you keep that all in perspective? And when it happens to your dancers, how do you go through that process of helping them get back on their feet, so to speak? Touch wood, we have been quite lucky. Um, you know, th there's not been many deal breaker injuries. Um, <laughs> and it's truth, the kids would tell you, I'm one of these, give it a rub, you'll be okay, get up, you'll be all right, you'll be all right. Going, you don't need to worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually started teaching with my foot in a cast. I didn't know, I, I went to the hospital in Ireland after I broke it, and they told me that it wasn't broken. Oh. So I came home and I started teaching and for about four weeks, I thought, this doesn't feel right. This really doesn't feel right. 
and then I went and had it re-x-rayed and they said it was broken so they put it in a cast and I, I, I still went to class my husband had to drive me but I still went to class and taught with the cast on <laughs> try teaching beginners with a cast on <laughs> yeah yeah so speaking of, of your husband now how do you find the support from family in, in your Irish dancing endeavors um you can't do it without it it's as simple as that I mean my husband um I can't say he would be a massive fan of it um but he knows it's my passion he knows that obviously it's my job um and he is incredibly supportive incredibly and I met him when I was 17 so he used to come to the festivals and come to the worlds and so he's been around it an awful long time he knew what he was getting into before he married you. <laughs> yeah, and and I always say, if he hadn't liked the dancing, he would have gone. The dancing wouldn't have gone. Right, right, right. Yeah, you know, but but Justine, so that's an interesting conversation right there. So many people, they may say that, and then maybe that it's just the, the quote unquote right person comes in, and the next thing you know, it it takes them away from it, and they leave, and then they ten years down the road, you may run into them and say, well, hey, why don't you come back? And they say, well, it's been there's been too much time, and it's like you let one person take you away from your passions, you know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I do. I, they probably call me preachy, actually, but I, mm. I do try and explain life lessons really to the kids as much as I do the dancing. Right. You know, it, it, Irish dancing is something that you can always return to. Mm -hmm. So, like, even if I hadn't gone immediately into teaching, I have colleagues that went away from dancing and came back to dancing 10 years later and started to teach. Mm -hmm. For women, it works perfectly around children. You know, you can, you can teach dancing alongside another career. You're never lost without Irish dancing, really. So, you know, it's something that uh, we'll, we'll see you through life, really. Going back a couple of years, if you could talk back to 21 year old Justine, what would you tell her about maybe prepping for the, for the, the career to come? There are so many pros to what we do. I have friends, life friends that I've met through Irish dancing, um, you know, that I could pick up the phone to and talk to. And, and if you're having a bad day, you can discuss things that are going on in your class. Um, so there are so many more positives than there are negatives. I'd be a liar if I said there weren't any negatives because right. of, over time, as a teacher, you can't please everybody. It's as simple as that. You know, you, you'll get kids that just, you feel like they're part of your family and then they might walk out the door. But you, you can't change that. That's that's just going to happen it happens in life so you've got to learn to move forward from that not take it too personally and um just continue but the the upside the opportunities the travel the friendships the just joy that you can get from Irish dancing is way way more than the bad side that you'll get from it I was recently having a conversation with some uh, a couple of teachers that you would know, and that that conversation has come up more times than I can count uh, with various teachers over the years as far as when when dancers leave and that might be a whole separate podcast in the future, the experience of coping with when dancers wow. leave. Have you developed any any techniques or strategies in uh, as far as dealing with those sort of disappointments in life or do you just you just gotten good at getting thick skin and rolling with the punches. I think the first child that went from the school, sure. um, she was incredibly successful. And I'd known her since she was a very little girl. And I think sometimes parents make decisions for children. It's not necessarily the child's decision. Right. I actually, it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but I felt bereaved. I felt absolutely bereaved mm -hmm. because you spend so much time with these children and they give to you what you give to them. And to lose that suddenly, and I suppose there is a little bit of why am I not good enough? 
why you know what else could i have done why would they would they think that you know they shouldn't stay they can go somewhere better um but i think after that um because i, I knew I'm, I'm not saying i don't get as involved with the children i definitely do there's no question about it i've never learned that lesson um but i think after that it just became slightly easier you know if i if i can get through that if i can cope with that if i can manage that then okay we just keep going mm -hmm. justine whether it's yourself or other people that you've talked to in the dance world how prevalent would you say imposter syndrome is if you know do you know what imposter syndrome is yeah but i'm not 100 percent sure of, of what the context so sort of like, uh, you know, people thinking, even though they may have a lot of talent, they think, oh, I don't deserve it, or I'm not good enough, you know, and why did I get that? Maybe I didn't really deserve that, you know, instead of just saying, okay, I've worked hard, not being braggadocious, but you know, I worked hard and I earned this. I think a lot of people feel that I'm not good enough. And when you lose students, or maybe uh, performance didn't go the way you think it did, or, or should have or something like that, it's easy to look back at yourself and say, I'm a failure, or I didn't do good enough. Have you experienced that and how did you overcome it if you did experience it? I think every dance teacher, if, if, if they were telling the truth, would say that they've gone through periods of that. And particularly when you teach on your own, although you do have colleagues that you, you can talk to occasionally, you still are quite isolated in your own thoughts of, am I on the right path? Am I doing the right thing? Um, you know, is what I'm doing working for these kids? Um, so I suppose everybody at some point has that imposter syndrome. But I have never needed a validation of a result or um, to feel right about things. I've, I, you know, I don't need that pat on the back. It, it, the success the class has had, and uh, there are many, many classes that have had way, way more success, but I have been fortunate the class has done very well over the last years. Um, I, just, I just feel that it's not about that validation for me. I love teaching. I absolutely love... I, I, I have a little girl at class. Now, she may never become a champion dancer, but the last two weeks, her enjoyment in that class with a clapping for everybody else and smiling, that, that's brought me so much joy in the last few weeks. So, you know, that's, that's what it's all about, really. Yeah, that, that's true. Well, those little ones, they will get you. I mean, they're so brutally honest sometimes, but then they, they just <laughs> yeah. do the sweetest things, you know, and it just makes yeah. it, you, I'm, I agree with you there. It kind of makes it all worthwhile. Um, if you could look at the, you talked about having a dancer there that, that may be getting ready to take an exam. So they may be embarking on their teaching career, whether it's your own student or it's someone that, that may be watching this podcast or a teacher that's watching this and say, Hey, I want my student to see this. What would be some of your points of advice for not just maybe someone wanting to become a teacher, but maybe they're already a teacher and they're looking to become a judge. So for those two first chapters in their potential teaching career, what would be your device, your advice for them on, the, the starting a chapter as a teacher or starting a new chapter as a judge? For teaching, um, just take it slow and steady. Um, you know, don't rush to be getting into the big league straight away. Don't be thinking you need to get into that big league straight away. Enjoy your beginners, enjoy the, the, the little wins, the, the kids getting the medals at the first feshes, you know, Find, find the experience of that before you want to push straight away into championship. Because with those kids then that are getting into the championship, and we all have that one that you think, oh, my God, this kid could be. Or, you know, um, just, again, let that ride take its course. Don't be so pushy that you need this kid a champion under six, under seven, under eight. Those, those are the years that the, the kids should be enjoying it. When they get to 13, 14, it becomes slightly more, um, I suppose, um, I can't think of the word, slightly more intense. 
but but let the babies be the babies. There are so many little ones now that are winning championships at six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And by the time they're 12, 13, 14, the drive has gone from them. They're just not interested in it at all. And and the parents then are anxious and need the kid to maintain that level. And and the kids are burnt out. They've just had enough. Um so just just enjoy the easy time to start with and then when the pressure starts to come when you've got those kids that that might be moving through then again just take it as it comes don't don't be looking to to put it all into right. one basket and, and then the, the adjudic judging yeah the judge the judges side of thing i see i love judging i absolutely love judging i love sitting down i love watching i love seeing new things that might evolve in front of me um again just enjoy it don't set out with any agendas don't set out with any preconceived notions or oh, such a body's in this competition such a body's in this competition what we're going to do what we're going to do just sit there and enjoy the dancing mm -hmm. we, we've got we've got the best job in the world we're being paid it my husband describes it as him going to watch a game of football you know, you're getting paid for doing something that you absolutely love to do. Right. Yeah. And you get to see the world at the same time if you're willing to travel. You know? If you if you're fortunate. Yeah. And and again, I think some of that comes from from the way that you've conducted yourself in the past or some of the friendships that you've made or maybe a few pupils have, have you know, been noticed by somebody and somebody's thought, oh, they're nice kids. She might mm -hmm. she she might be on the same wavelength as me, you know, when she sits down to judge. You don't you don't know really but i i feel absolutely blessed i've been very very fortunate okay i met michael i met michael at one of my very first feshes that that's where we met and i thought he was the most handsome guy and he was judging and we'd arrived <laughs> early and we went to dinner and, and from that point we've been friends 25 years you know yeah we make some so, great friendships in, in dance for sure you really do yeah and, and I guess lastly, Justine, if you, going back a little bit, uh, talking about your own teacher and then maybe maybe just people you've ran into along your journey, what's some of the best advice you've given or maybe some of the things that you picked up early in your dancing life that's helped you become successful and maybe keeps you going to this day? I just think in Miss Kelly's class, she was fabulous about basics. And because we had the music in the class, I think the musicality in our dancing came through. We were all known as really strong, powerful, heavy dancers. Light dancers, maybe not so much because she wasn't so keen on, on doing the light dances. Right. But she knew every traditional set dance. We danced every traditional set dance, which again, I think is fantastic for learning your basic rhythms and timings. And I, I, I just think she taught us the right way. Don't rush into material that kids are not ready for. Go through the groundwork before you move on to the, on to the more difficult material. Um, and that will give you a more rounded dancer overall. Very good. Justine, I appreciate you coming on and sharing those experiences with us. And I wish you all the best, you and your school and your students and whatever's coming your way. Thank you very much. It's been lovely speaking to you and nice to meet you.